Hello, Sector Watchers. Welcome to the show. This is the 118th episode of Sector Spotlight for Tuesday, the 20th of June. And I'm recording this on Monday, the 19th. So all of you in the US, happy Juneteenth. I hope you enjoyed your long weekend. And it's good news for me because I don't have to wait for the US markets to close. Anyway, we will take a look at some of stuff in asset class rotation. A quick look, longer term perspective, only on the weeklies. We'll address Bitcoin, we'll address the S&P 500 and Euro dollar. We'll take a look at sectors, uh, zoom in on the differences between the cap weighted and the equal weighted versions and take a look at some of the individual stocks inside the consumer discretionary sector. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Sector Spotlight. Let's start with a quick overview of what's happening in asset classes. I am going to only use the weekly RRG and the weekly, well, not only the weekly charts. I'm going to use the weekly RRG for the longer term trends and then bring up <coughs> a few of the individual charts to see if we can get a handle on what may be next. If we look at the RRG on the left hand side, then we see that it is still pretty distorted by the move of Bitcoin. That big long tail here, yellow inside the weakening quadrant is for Bitcoin versus the US dollar. And we're using the VBINX, which is a Vanguard balanced index fund that represents a portfolio of 60% stocks and 40% bonds. So Bitcoin is not in there and that makes it an asset class that can show wide divergences versus that benchmark. And that's what's happening right now. Maybe you've seen all the messages that Bitcoin was uh, trading below or at least towards 25,000, which was a major support level. And during the week, last week, Bitcoin moved slightly below it, but then again moved above it and it actually shows how fluid and how rough these support and resistance levels that we can mark in the Bitcoin chart on the Bitcoin chart actually are. I'm going to toggle off this tail here because it sort of compresses everything that's going around there around the benchmark. And we would like to see that a little bit better. So take that off and then say fit. And then we can see what's actually going on in the other asset classes and there we have the story that is alive for a couple of weeks already which clearly speaks to the advantage of the stock market. SPY is now very clearly moving into the leading quadrant at a nice tail, nice heading between 0 and 90 degrees and on the opposite side you can see the cluster of fixed income related asset classes that's high yield government bonds and corporate bonds. So Without even looking at the individual charts, I can clearly tell you that there is a clear preference for stocks over bonds, no matter which fixed income related asset class you're looking at, stocks are handsomely beating that performance at the moment in terms of trend. If you look at the other three asset classes on this graph, that's the US dollar and that's two commodity indexes, commodity ETFs, GSG and DJP. And they're all inside the improving quadrant and they're all moving lower, all have um, rolled over and are now heading back towards the lagging quadrant. And that is, as you know, a, uh, the sign of a, of a strong negative relative move. Now, let's take a look at some of these individual charts. There is no doubt that these longer term trends, it will take a lot more to turn these trends that we're currently seeing on this RRG with these type of tails to turn those around. Let's start with the uh, dollar, with the euro dollar. So this is the dollar index. I, I prefer to look at, well, the dollar index is a good chart too, but I prefer to look at something that's really tradable that, that represents the actual comparison in this case between the euro and the dollar, probably the most traded currency pair in the world. And what you see here is that a new low was set around 106.4 and the euro started to improve, the dollar started to weaken. 
And last week, especially after the release of the uh, FAT meeting or the, uh, after the FAT meeting, we saw that jump here from that 107, 107 and a half below 108 area to almost 110. And, and it means that we're now rapidly moving back towards that 110, 111 area. And that remains, a I, I think, a pretty crucial level for euro dollar. If that's been taken out, that very likely triggers more strength for the euro against the dollar. Uh, first target to look at, probably in the area of 115. We're not there yet, but please keep that in mind. The fact that this low here on that weekly chart came in at a higher level than the previous one indicates that buyers are more aggressive and sellers are only willing to sell at a higher level. So that is a positive for the euro and a negative for the dollar. If euro dollar moves up, it's a strong euro and a weak dollar. And if we bring that to the daily chart, you can see that a little bit more detail. And we talked about this small double bottom that we had here, and that was actually taking out right, well, this is, when was that? The 13, so 14. So that was right on the day of, of that fat meeting was taken out. And we see the acceleration now, and we gotta wait and see what's gonna happen, let's say between 110 and 111. We go to the next one, that's SPY. And here's the weekly chart of SPY. If there was ever a doubt whether SPY was breaking to the upside, here is your clear uh, confirmation of that breakout. We were looking at the area uh, around 415, and then it became 425, 424, 425, and that was clearly broken last week. This is a break. This is a very clear break. And it means that the former resistance level, in this case around 425, maybe 415, can now be expected to act as support in case SPY, SPY will go into a corrective mode. So we are now really uh, back into that uptrend if we weren't there already. But everybody was waiting for that break. Here is your break. The upside is now targeting the area around 450. Again, as you can see, it's not a clear cut like two digits uh, behind the dec two decimal digits number. It's more of a range. And I've marked it here uh, at this high here, which is 447, 447 half. And then this here is, let's say, 452 and a half. So the average would be 450 as a first target for SPY. If that's taken out, the next one is the all-time high. And that's what we're waiting for, of course. There's no divergence, not in the RSI, not in the MACD so that there is nothing at the moment that is likely to stop this move. And if we look at the daily chart of SPY, you can see that even better. Here is that break, here is the initial break, 415, 417, and here is that 425 area. You can see how we hovered a couple of days here between the 1st of June and then the real breakout was the 9th of June. That's when we really jumped above it. And we're now coming in at 4.39.46. That was last Friday. That break is very clearly, we're on the way to 4.50. On the downside, 4.25, maybe 4.15 if it gets stretched, are the support levels to watch. Here also on the RSI, it's a little bit overbought, but, uh, but remember, a high RSI is a good sign. It means that the market is strong. There is no divergence, and it's not coming out of that overbought territory yet. That's what you may want to be looking for. If we look at IEF, that's the seven to 10 year yields. You can see how these tails are moving lower. And the reason why that is, is that because the prices of bonds are moving lower while the prices of stocks are going higher. That's why these tails are moving in opposite directions. And more clearly, the reason why these tails here are inside lagging is because these relative strength lines, and this is on IEF, but we'll, we'll look at the other ones in a minute. You can see how they are breaking important support levels in terms of relative strength, and they're pushing the RRG lines back below 100. So there is very clearly uh, a relative downtrend for bonds, in this case, seven to 10 year treasury bonds. However, if we look at corporate bonds, this is LQD, you can see the same. This price chart isn't all that bad, to be honest. Uh, it's still moving kind of sideways. And if we can take out this falling trend line, it would even be slightly positive. 
But the relative strength is what worries me. Here is very clearly, again, a break below support in relative strength, and that's pushing the RRG lines lower. Again, if we do that for HYG, that's high yield bonds, you can see that the price chart is not all that bad. We're depending a little bit on how you draw that trend line. I could draw that trend line a slit with a little less angle and it, it would not be breaking out. And that shows you how subjective these trend lines are. For me, they're kind of a guideline. They're not like, hey, we're breaking out here. This is a signal. It's more like an indication that there is definitely some upside pressure there. People are trying to buy this and they could push it higher. The problem is, other, in the other asset class, so because this is only comparing it with VBI and X, which is stocks and bonds, so the other asset class here, SPY, is moving up way faster than, uh, in this case, uh, high yield bonds. And that's pushing that relative strength line lower and causing that ROG lines to move lower. So that, that negative move in terms of relative strength for high yield is still prevailing. If we have a quick look at commodities, then we can see here how DJP actually rallied last week, bounced off almost that lower boundary of that falling trend channel. We're now targeting the upper boundary of that falling trend channel. But look at the relative strength here. This is, this is very clearly a weak relative strength line. And you can see how these ROG lines, they're almost moving sideways. And that's what you can see here. DJP had a very short tail and at at very low RS ratio levels. And that's what you see here. You see that red RS ratio line stable at a low level. That's this point right here. And you can see how that green line is hovering around 100. It's very close to the 100 line right here. So despite the move up during last week, the relative strength of DJP has not changed very much yet. And we will see a similar picture with GSG. A nice break above previous highs, but still below that falling trend line. And you can see how the red strength line is breaking, was breaking and is holding below that breakout level. And here also you see almost horizontal moves by both RRG lines. So commodities are still one of the weaker asset, well, maybe the weakest asset class in this universe that we're looking at right here. Let's have a quick look at Bitcoin because that's, you know, still a lot of people like to look at that and they are watching it and they're writing about it. And here you see how fluid that 25K level is. If you look at it here and I say, hey, there is support at 25,000. Everybody says, yeah, of course, this is 25K. The truth is that it's, it can easily be 500 to 1,000 bucks off because that's the, that's the type of swings that Bitcoin can make you. So please, if you're looking for some level in Bitcoin to be broken, make sure that it is a significant break and that it is a very clear break and that you're not just trading some of these fade moves, these fades where it just breaks and then bounces back up because that's exactly what happened last week. We saw that Bitcoin was punching through 25K. That's right here. That was on the 15th and the 14th. So, and then we, we started just over the weekend, we started to move. This, this is trading 24 seven. So you gotta, you gotta be awake during the weekend as well. And you can see how this jumped off that 25K support level. And we're now already 26.78. So that's almost 27,000, that's $2,000 off that 25K level. And even more if we take it from, this is 24.760. So that's almost 3000 bucks in a couple of days while we were testing support, and as you can see, I mean, I marked it at 25,000, but this is 25.2, and you can see how the low here came in at 24.76. That's 250 bucks under 25,000. That's in, in Bitcoin terms, that is not very much. So I'm gonna say that for now, 25K as support has held up, and Bitcoin is moving up, back towards the upper boundary of that falling trend line. And this is 27.4. If we can take out 27,400, let's make it 27 and a half, just nice round number. If we can take that out, Bitcoin is definitely on the way back for further improvement. That's a completely different story than breaking below 25,000. So be careful with that volatile thing. And then finally, in the asset class world, here is your confirmation that stocks are now definitely uh, to be preferred over bonds. This is the ratio between SPY and IEF. It's a very clear break here. We're moving to all-time highs. 
I don't know where it's going to stop, but this, I know that a chart like this, if you, if we would take away that SPY IF ratio, if we would take away that price axis, everybody will say that this is a chart that can move much, much higher. How high? Only time will tell. Moving to stocks and sectors. And in the previous segment on asset classes, we saw that SPY, so the stock market, is very clearly in a relative uptrend versus fixed income. Uh, so it is the preferred asset class for the moment. And last Friday, I wrote an article in the RRG blog, which is a little bit shorter term orientated. Usually I work with the weekly RRG, the weekly charts, as you know, but I thought to write a piece on shorter term rotations because they get a lot of attention. And as a matter of fact, in a few of these FANG stocks, the rotations are very clear and the setups in the price charts are kind of negative. So I hope I can make myself clear saying that the longer term trends, as we've seen them on the RRG and as we'll show, as I'll point them out in a minute on the RRGs and the, and the weekly price charts, is still pretty good. However, in the near term, there is a very good possibility that a few of these stocks and on the back of these stocks, because they're major stocks, a few of the sectors may see some sort of a setback and that could drag the S&P down. But we already saw that after the breakout, the S&P got a little bit stretched and there's good support at lower levels, uh, 425, 415, those levels that we just spoke about. And from 440, where we currently are, that's not a super big deal if you look at what we've already done. I mean, a healthy trend sometimes needs to retreat to sort of recuperate and, and get a little bit of new fuel and, uh, and, and uh, recover before it jumps further. And that's what the article that I wrote in the blog is all about, uh, especially because it's talking about a few of these major stocks, most notably the, uh, the semiconductor stocks, Nvidia and AMD. And you can read that, you can read that blog so we don't have to go over it. But what, what triggered me to write the piece is that a lot of these charts, especially the daily charts, you see nice breakouts, massive gaps, and then you see heavy negative divergences between RSI and price. And Negative divergence in itself is not a signal. But when we start seeing some breakdowns on daily price charts for a few of these names, then I think we should pay attention because they could drag, especially the communication services and the technology sector, and to a lesser degree, the consumer discretionary, a little bit down. Again, longer term trends are still very, very valid. So we've got the RRG for the cap weighted sectors right here. And another thing that I want to point out to you is that we got a lot of messages from users saying, hey, the ticker symbols for the equal weight sectors have changed. Yes, and we know it and it will be changed. But if you hit the equal weight group on the ROG, you will get this error message right now. That will hopefully, well, most likely be solved um, during the coming week when we release a new version of the website with a lot of new functionality and then all these ticker symbols will be uh, updated as well. The ticker symbols are already in the database. So if you want, uh, you could actually create that equal weight RRG yourself because these are the ticker symbols. You can find them. If you pause the video, you can see where they are right now here. And the only thing you need to do is punch them in the, uh, in the symbols box right here, run the RRG, and when you have it, you can actually save this as a bookmark. So you can bookmark it in your own browser, and then you will have that equal weight RRG at your fingertips. Um, again, sometime this week, this group will be updated, and then you can, you can pull it back uh, from the drop down again. But if you want, and that's not only for equal weight, if you want to have your own RRG with a select selection of symbols, maybe your portfolio, just punch them in right here, 
save it as a bookmark and it'll always be uh, right there at your fingertips to use. <clears throat> What's interesting, when you compare the current cap-weighted RRG with the equal-weighted RRG, you can see how distorted the cap-weighted one is with the, the, the three big sectors, so discretionary, technology and communication services, uh, in the, on the right-hand side and all the others on the left-hand side. If you look at the equal weight, it is way more spread out and evenly spread, logical, but it's always interesting to just actually see it in action, or at least that's what I think. If we go over these individual sectors on, on both RRGs, we can see some notable differences. So if we do communication services, and we can do communication services here, you can see how the tail on the cap weighted is way longer than it is on the equal weighted. And it tells me that communication services is going through some sort of a setback, but the setback is way bigger on the cap weighted than it is uh, in the equal weighted. Again, on both sides, it's on the right hand side, so it's one of the stronger sectors. If you look at consumer discretionary, then that's interesting. You can see how the cap weighted has just entered the leading, oh, wrong, wrong version, wrong chart, has just entered the leading quadrant coming from improving after a dip and then moving into it. Where if we do that on the equal weight version, you can see how discretionary actually makes that, that turn that we like to see where it's actually going from leading into weakening, turning back up, and almost on the verge of moving back into leading. That underscores the broader strength for the consumer discretionary sector um, compared to the cap weighted version. The same stocks are in there, but that, that when they're equal weighted, you can see the real strength of the consumer discretionary sector. If we look at consumer staples, you can see how the tails are moving exactly the same on the uh, equal weight, it's still on the right hand side. Uh, on the cap weighted, you can see how it's actually uh, weaker. And that's what we talked about last week, a strong rotation out of defensive that's still going on. And to a lesser degree, that's also happening in the, weak, in the uh, equal weight version. If we look at energy, that's way on the left. And that is equal weight is a little better, but they're not fantastic. If you look at financials, that's an interesting tale because it's, it's confirming each other. They're moving in the same direction, but they're still way to the left of the RRG, making it one of the weaker sectors. So this is very likely just a hiccup in a strong relative downtrend. Healthcare, we're moving out of defensive sectors, very clearly in the cap weighted, but you can also see it happening in the equal weighted. It's underscoring the strength of the market, people. When you're moving out of defensive sectors, it's usually a strong sign for the market. Industrials are actually um, showing a very strong tail on the equal weight uh, not so much on the cap weighted, but you can see again, it's the same group of stocks and versus the equal weight, they're actually rotating back into the leading quadrant. So under the hood, the uh, industrial sector is actually pretty good. If you look at materials, that is on both sides, not fantastic. If you look at real estate, it's a little better on the equal weight but the tail is very very uh, short so it means that there is a weak trend and it's very stable so it's an underperformer and here you've got technology we cap weighted it's in leading moving down but look at this here last week we actually moved back up so it's the strongest sector on the rg on the rs ratio and it's moving back up that's a strong sign for technology and cap weighted is kind of doing the same but trailing a little bit so that means that under the hood, that technology sector is getting a broader base, it's picking up. And then the last sector here is again a defensive one and it's confirming each other, strong rotation out of defensive sectors. If you look at the individual charts inside the consumer discretionary sector, and this is the group of consumer discretionary um, stocks, and this is the cap weighted sector. If we do it against the, um, Consumer discretionary, so RSPD, we got the a little broader based and we can see how that's moving. 
and I've actually, I need to hurry up a little bit here. If we go over a few of these uh, tails, then especially the cruise lines are showing very strong charts. We've got RCL, we've got CCL, and we've got NCLH. Three cruise lines and three very strong charts. If you look at RCL right here, look at how that is moving. Look at CCL, which is just coming out of that base pattern. So from a potential point of view, um, I think that CCL has a little bit more left than RCL, but maybe the most important one is NCLH, Norwegian, which is just breaking out of that base uh, and offering a lot of upside potential. And then very rapidly, Tesla back in the game, very good. KMX, CarMax needs to take out 82, 82 and a half, but it's coming out of a big base. Relative strength is improving. And here you got Ford, another uh, motor company, actually coming out of a very nice big triangle formation. Needs to take out 15 bucks, but the upside's definitely there. And then finally, uh, here is Whirlpool, which is coming out of a base, completing a double bottom pattern. First target around 157, 158, but after that 170 is possible. And that wraps up Sector Spotlight for this week. Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed the show. We've always been airing on Tuesdays from 10.30 to 11 a.m. Eastern, but we are very likely going to make some changes. I'm not entirely sure what that means for Sector Spotlight. The show will not disappear. I will be doing it. Uh, it just may be in a different format and a different time. So please stay tuned. Be on the lookout for Sector Spotlight. And I hope to see you again at a new episode of Sector Spotlight sometime next week.